on this computer. All right, we've been recording for our second Zoom session, and uh, we're going to finish off, I think, uh, Unit 1 today for sure. We might even get started on uh, Unit 2, which is practice with reading input-output functions. But I'll share a screen here, and we'll get to uh, my computer, and we'll pull up a couple of notes here from where we were. So when we see this over here, if I scroll all the way up, we went down page one, as both of you are saying, and I'll scroll down to the bottom of page one. We talked about input plus gain is output. And then we got to the bottom of page one where we talked about in all hearing aid specs, there are two kinds of graphs. One's a frequency response graph, and the other one is an input-output function. And just to highlight, let me just show you what that would be. I'll scroll down here to where we kind of left off. Now, here is, I'll just give you an example of a frequency response. I'm just going to show you, okay? Look at the axes and read what they say, read what it says. On the bottom, you have frequency, okay, from 200 hertz all the way up to 10,000 hertz. Do you see that? And on the vertical, the axis is gain in this particular case. So when you think of frequency response, think of a graph where the axes are frequency on the horizontal and on the vertical is amplitude. And that's what we even had in acoustics when we studied, when we talked about sound waves and then we talked about spectrums. And a spectrum is frequency on the horizontal, amplitude on the vertical. And I said last year to you in acoustics that in a way, in a way, I'll stop sharing for just a sec, in a way, a spectrum is like a slice. Remember I said the sound wave would be like a loaf of bread and you take a slice of it and turn it sideways so you can see the raisins, okay? A spectrum shows you what frequencies are in a complex sound. If you have a complex sound wave, it's hard to tell what the frequencies are because a sound wave is time and amplitude. Time this way and amplitude that way. But you can't tell the frequencies. You've got to have something to help you tell what the frequencies are. And in a hearing aid, a, spectrum, a, a, a frequency response shows the spectrum. So you can see what the hearing aid is doing. Look at this picture here where you've got one, two, three, and four. This is showing you the volume control range, the effects of the volume control. If the volume control is turned way down, you've got very little gain happening because you can see your vertical axis says gain. So you've got around 30 dB of gain happening with a low volume setting. And as you increase the volume control up to its maximum, you can see the gain that the hearing aid is delivering across the frequencies. You can see that most of the gain here is happening at 1,000 hertz in this particular case. This is just an example, okay? Now, the other type of way of showing what a hearing aid is doing is when you talk about a... Hang me on here. Why is this frozen? God, zooks, I hate that. Okay, well, over here. Now, we'll just show you this puppy. Come on, Ted, I think there you go. This is an input-output function. This is showing you the same thing as this did. The very same thing. In other words, it's the same hearing aid. But look what's happening in, the, in, this, in this picture here. The axis is input, and the vertical axis is output. Okay? So this is not showing you frequency. Look what's missing here. It's a freak, where's frequency? It's not on here. That's why I wrote input at 2000 hertz. Because in ANSI testing of hearing aids, when it's the law, it's a rule. When you show input output functions for a hearing aid, you can see that the, that, that the frequency has to be 2000 hertz. And the reason why it's 2000 hertz is because that's the most important frequency for understanding what is said. That's where vowels and consonants meet. It's at 2000 hertz. So an input-output function, this is showing you the same thing as this did. It's showing you what the volume control is doing. So let's look and review what this says from last week. Look at volume control number one. That's the lowest position. That's the softest position. Back over to here, volume control number one. Look where you had the least amount of gain. 
Okay, volume control number one. Let's read what this says. Let's make the graph make sense. To do that, and I'm going to even blow it up even bigger so you can see it larger here. Pay very close attention here. At volume control number one, which means the softest volume, let's look at, let's say, for example, an input of 50. So I'm going to look where my cursor is. The input is at 50. And when the volume control is turned way down, if my input is 50, Look where my output is. I'm moving here, moving here, moving here. Boom. My output is about 85, about 80-ish, 85. Okay. When I crank up my volume and crank it up to maximum, let's go back to, the, to an input of 50. Move 50, move 50, move 50, move 50, move 50. Now my output is 110. So input plus gain is output. Output minus gain is input. If my input is 50 and my output is 110, 110 minus 50 is a gain of 60. Whereas when my volume control was down, an input of 50 meant my output was about 85. 85 minus 50 is 35. So can you see from last week, the trick we were talking about on input-output functions, the rightmost line is actually the least gain. And the leftmost line is the most gain. And that's the trick of reading input-output functions. It's backward to what you think. Because I'm mostly, when you go to the right, things mean more. When you go to the left, things mean less. But when you're looking at input-output functions, don't even try to understand why. Just let the graph talk to you. Just let it tell the story. And I believe, like Kelly said last week, to see what the gain is on this hearing aid, I mean, look at an input of zero, an output of 60. Okay, well, that's only when the volume control was at maximum, number four. And then this hearing aid went into compression. Look at the, how the lines bend. That meant no one ever wanted an output more than 110. They didn't want it to happen. So by gum, the output could never get above 110. But you could change the gain like crazy. Just make sure that the input plus that gain never went more than 110. And then again, it's, it's really, it's, I find it interesting. Here you can see the gain at 2,000 hertz. It's about 35. Look at this. At volume number one, the gain was about 35. Told you, volume number one with an input of 50, my output was 85. 85 minus 50 is 35. Well, let's find out at 2,000 hertz, input of 50. Okay, my, what, what, what was my gain? Because read the, read the graph, the gain on the vertical. At 2,000 hertz, my gain was about 35-ish. Told you. So that's, the, that's the, the marriage or the union of those two types of graphs to read hearing aids. And this is universal all over the world. It's just the way hearing aid specs are shown, the way hearing aid behavior is shown. So now let's go to our notes again, back to here. So, so on, those, on those graphs, is that yeah. something that, uh, you know, I've never done, I've not been in practicum or labs or any of that, so I'm not familiar right. with any of these. So, uh, the fitting software that all yep. these companies have, do yep. they print these graphs? Is that the what they fittings, do? You will see these graphs on all fitting software. Yep. Okay. And Kelly, you're asking a good question. Most of the time, you'll see frequency response. Most of the time. Definitely. The more nerdy of us, the audiologists and the people who like stuff like this, they can dig under the software and find the input-output functions. Okay? But most people you fit by using the frequency response. But it's important to know what they both are. So here in our notes, in all hearing aid specs, two kinds of graphs, frequency response, the functions. Okay? Now we can move to describe, we'll move through this talk here. Older hearing aid circuits provided linear gain. I'm going to hold, I'm going to 
to gray this out so we can read it together. Okay, same gain for all input levels, one to one input output ratio. Same, not the same gain for all frequencies. Mm -mm, don't mix this up. That's why I, that's why I made italics in it. In, in, in other words, I'll show you what this means. Let's look at a picture. Is the, look at volume control number four. Is this the same gain for all frequencies? Hell no. You got way more gain here at 1,000 hertz than you do at 200 hertz. Okay, and then it goes down, and then more gain, and then down, and then more gain. So never think that that's not what it's telling you. If I show you the next picture, though, yup, same gain for all inputs because the line is a 45-degree angle. It's tit for tat. Let's just look at the number four line to give us an example. An input of zero, output of 60. Input of 20, output of 80. Input of 40, output of 100. The difference between those pairs of numbers is always, in this case, 60. As my input went up by 20, my output went up by 20. Until you hit the curve. And that curve is called the knee point. Just like a knee. <laughs> it's a knee. Okay, it's a bend in the function. So input-output functions always have a knee point, and the knee point shows you when the gain changed, when the maximum output was limited. And it shows you, okay, in this case, with the volume control set at maximum, my knee point happened at 50. As soon as the input got to be 50, the hearing aid said, okay, I'm going to start slowing down. I can't because input plus gain is output. And if my gain is 60, an input of 50 is going to give me an output of 110. And I've got to make sure never to let any more come out. So I'm going to start reducing my gain. And that's what happened here. Okay. Back to our notes. Let's, whoa, back to the notes. Can you handle it, Ted? Okay. So here you go. Same gain for all input levels, one-to-one input-output ratio. For every 1 dB of increased out input, there's a corresponding proportionate 1 dB of increased output, one-to-one. -one. So 10 dB input increase results in a 10 dB output increase. Linear hearing aids are okay for so soft input levels. Let's look at the picture again. Great. For soft input levels, because the gain can remain whatever it can be. There's no limiting happening here. There's no squeezing of the sound. There's no distortion, because here's where distortion will happen. Okay? Where the hearing aid will start to sound kind of bad. It won't sound very good. So the hear linear hearing aids limited the maximum output by means of something called <coughs> And we'll look at that. Linear hearing aids were okay for soft inputs because the output never exceeded maximum power output. The maximum power output should correspond with the UCL of the listener, with the uncomfortable loudness of the listener. Now, let's say you're doing a hearing test on somebody and the person raises a hand when, 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 when it's about 100 dB. Now, have you learned any of this in audiometry class so far? Have you learned about uncomfortable loudness testing? Yeah. Okay. So, if a person's loudness discomfort level is, let's say, 100 dB on the audiogram, remember the audiogram is in dBHL, isn't it? It's not dBSPL. Hearing aids are dBSPL. And we said in psychoacoustics, too, remember we said that zero dB SPL, okay, is, is, is the softest it takes for a person to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears, and that at different frequencies, you needed more dB SPL to just barely hear, and that's why you had a curve, all right? The curve touched the ground at zero, but at 2,000 hertz, it was even a little bit less than zero. And then at lower frequencies, it was way above zero. Like to hear 125 hertz, it takes 40 dB SPL, okay, to just barely hear. And then we took, so the, our hearing sensitivity is uneven across the frequencies. We hear 
five, one, two, and four the best. That's our Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's our, those are our four gospel frequencies. Those, that's what we hear the best. When we get above 4,000 hertz, our hearing isn't as good anymore. When we get below 500 hertz, our hearing isn't as good anymore. And that's why you had that curve that we studied in acoustics. Well, they take that curve and that's flattened out to, to, call, to be called zero dB HL. So zero dB HL on your audiogram really is that curve. And that curve is built into your audiometer. And that's why your audiometers are calibrated every year to make sure that that, that zero dB HL at 125 Hertz is really 40 dB SPL. And that at five, 250 Hertz, zero dB HL really is about 12 dB SPL. Okay, all those different those numbers are built in. Okay, back to our notes. That because of that curve, MPO should correspond with the listener's loudness discomfort level. You're going to take the UCL as you measured on the audiogram, and you're going to add about 10 to 15 dB to that. Why? Because that curve, all the speech frequencies are a little bit above zero. Only 1,000 hertz and 2,000 hertz are at zero. 4,000 hertz isn't at zero and neither is five. They're a little bit above. So they take the average of that difference of that curve at five, one, two, and four, and that's about 10 to 15 dB SPL. So that's why that is added on to the UCL. So if your UCL is 100, you're going to set your MPO to about 110, 115. Because humans are measured in dBHL, hearing aids are measured in dBSPL. Okay? On the programming software that we're using, yeah. uh, are, are we, are, is the option there to fit linear? Yeah, barely. Not really. What you're going to see, Tina, is... If it, the hearing aids all today, they do provide linear gain for some inputs. And they provide compression for other inputs. So linear isn't thrown away. It actually is it's not thrown away. It's used. But it used to be that all hearing aids were only linear. They weren't compression at all. They didn't use it. Right. They were strictly linear. Today, our compression hearing aids use linear processing for some inputs. And then they go into compression for other inputs. Great question. It's good, good. Glad you asked that. Now let's go and look at linear hearing aids, what they did and why they sucked. Okay. Linear hearing aids, bad for high intensity inputs because the output will reach and try to exceed the maximum output. And when it does this, the hearing aid saturates. I put that word in italics, like a sponge. You know how you can put a sponge in water and the sponge will only absorb so much water. It can't absorb any more water. When you take it out of the pail, it's dripping, okay? That means the sponge has saturated. Well, same with the hearing, the linear hearing aid. It's, it's full. It's not gonna put out any more output. It's, you've lim it's, got, it's got a limiting, limiting factor. So read what it says here, saturation. Maximum SPL that the hearing aid can produce, and what that means is the maximum output SPL that the hearing aid can produce with any given gain, regardless of the input level. So give it, here's an example. Input of 60 and a gain of 50, an output of 110. Input of 70, gain of 50, outputs 120. Let's say they set the saturation level at 130. Take, for example, a case where the guy's loudness discomfort level was 115 dBHL. You're going to add about 10 to 15 to that, you'll get 130. So we'll say, okay, no more than 130 SPL can come out. Okay, 90 in, sorry, your gain will only be 40 because you set your maximum power output at 130. Input of 100, sorry, your gain can only be 30 now because you've set your saturation, your maximum power output at 130. All hearing aids have amplifiers that create and distort. 
all hearing aids, read that carefully, all hearing aids are amplifiers and all amplifiers distort. There's no such thing. And so when you buy a set of headphones or, or an amplifier system of any type, a stereo, a ghetto blaster, whatever you buy, when you buy it, you, you'll get a manual with it, right? And when you read the manual, guess what? You'll talk, they'll talk about the amplitude distortion. If you look at the specs, the little boring writing at the back of the, of the manual, it'll give the specs for the device you bought. And it'll talk about the amount of distortion it gives. You never get anything for free. There is nothing for free in life. So when you amplify, the challenge is to distort the least. So if we read here, no distortion if the output waveform shape is exactly the same shape as the input waveform. I will stop sharing and talk to you right here. Say you have a speaker. I wish I had one just hanging around here, but we're moving, so <laughs> even the pictures are now off the wall. We're in the process of moving. Yikes. Anyway, a speaker. Think of a speaker box, and you know how a speaker vibrates. If you can see the cone of the speaker when it's producing sound, it vibrates. Okay, that's cool because it's wiggling in the air. But let's say you make it wiggle so much, now it's because you've turned up the volume. Now, now it's going to hit something, the back of the, the back wall, the thing that, that the box that's holding the speaker, the speaker cone is going to And we've even heard amplitude distortion in devices at, what do you call it, Dairy Queen places that are playing loud music or if you're waiting in line at some place and there's a cheap speaker at a carnival or something and distortion. It's just crummy sound. You've overdriven the system. And so instead of the wave, you know how sound waves are waves like this, or that, that, that's how we draw them. Well, guess what? If you're making it bang, 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 you're making the wave square. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner and got a square, you know what, okay? When you've turned sound waves into square waves, you've created a different sound. You've added harmonics to it. You've created harmonic distortion. I always talk about it in a joking way, saying it's like you've invited Mary to the party. And unbeknownst to you, Mary brings her two kids along. Aww. It's not what you wanted. No, I'm speaking from a guy's point of view. Say you, you meet some fella and you think, hey, great, he's coming to the party and he brings his kid along. Like, wasn't what you had in mind. So the sound coming out of the hearing aid isn't identical to the input. The harmonic distortion has created other sounds. And that's why ANSI testing, one of the five ANSI tests, is harmonic distortion. How much is the hearing aid distorting? And harmonic distortion, if you will recall, is always done in percent. Is it 10%? Is it 15%? What's the percent of harmonic distortion? In ANSI testing, you have the maximum power output. That's called the OSPL90. You have the, uh, I think your full on gain, that's another measurement. You have a reference test gain is another measurement you have. And then you have, I think, equivalent input noise. And the last one is harmonic distortion. You have ANSI testing that you probably learned in hearing aid components. So it's just, that's why these things are measured because hearing aids produce crap like that. And you want your distortion, of course, to be as little as possible. Okay, and you will read, and this is this what's talking to you right here, amplitude distortion. As a result, new sounds are introduced. The effect of amplitude distortion is harmonic distortion. Recall ANSI testing? New harmonics are added to the original pure tones of 5 and 800 and 1600 hertz. Now we got review here, look at this. Linear gain, straight line at a 45 degree angle. Amplifier is producing no distortion when it produces straight linear gain. As the input amplitude is increased, output amplitude is proportionately increased. Note where the nonlinear portion begins. That's the knee point. Now, 
changes to input amplitude do not produce proportional changes to output. Now, a 10 dB input increase won't result in a 10 dB output increase. Uh -uh. The output will not increase as much as the input because it's being held. You can reach a point where the input increases result in no further output increase at all. This is especially true for linear hearing aids. Maximum power output equals distortion. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner and got a square rear end. You are now producing square waves where you once had sound waves or sine waves. When hearing aids saturated, that's what linear hearing aids did. They really sounded terrible. And here's the key word to remember. How did they limit the MPO? They used peak clipping. And I'll show you a picture of that. Peak clipping. So we will go to our good old thing here. Here's a picture of peak clipping. Okay, here's the sound waves. And with added gain, added gain, the sound waves are being made bigger. Oh, now you are limiting. Look at the squares being made, okay? Because now the speaker is literally hitting the, so the back of the metal box. So you have limited your maximum power output, but you've done it by means of peak clipping, which really sounded terrible. Then came compression. Look at compression. The bottom. As the input out, as the output increases, increases, ah, the waves are limited, but not by means of peak clipping. Instead, think of it like a rapids in a river. The river is moving like crazy down this direction, and in the river there's a rapids kind of going back. And that's what compression is. It's kind of like a back current stopping or resisting the main current to slow it down a bit and that's how you can think about it and you know in analogy hey, froze what's Sometimes that his internet connection kind of goes oh mine says that too internet are we okay now hello hello can you hear me now you froze and you froze yeah we've all froze <laughs> We'll let ourselves un. <laughs> How are we doing now? Good. Okay. Yeah. We're back, we're back from un we're back from freeze land. All right. So think of a river and a rapids in the river. The rapids in the river is the compression, and so compression limits the MPO without peak clipping. So we still use linear gain today, but we use compression instead of peak clipping to limit the MPO, which results in less distortion. And I said last week too, I think I remember this, think of Ted vet jumping on a bed and banging his head against the ceiling. Hard peak clipping is when the ceiling is cement and Ted's head hurts. Compression is when someone nailed a big thick piece of sponge to the ceiling. So now when Ted jumps up and down on the bed, he hits his head, but it doesn't hurt as bad because there's a sponge going, brr, 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 it slows it down. That's the rapids in the river, the sponge on the ceiling, compression, limiting the MPO without peak clipping. So now we'll share so screen where again. That, where does that, go, that, that does it it never gives that feedback of hitting ever with compression. Yeah, that's correct. Is it that limits, correct? It limits the MPO, it, but without peak clipping. That's the idea. And that, okay, so let's say, does it totally shut it off? Let's say someone happens to be standing by a train when the whistle blows and it goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. That frequency, does it just totally cut it off or? It doesn't cut it off. It just limits I mean, the amount. It just limits it. So if your output is set to, if your maximum power output is set to be 120, it'll let 110 come out, 118, 119, 120, but not 121, not 122. Sorry. With compression, though, it's a little bit different. And that's why I think you're, you're asking a great question, Tina. Let's look at that. Let's look at what compression, 
Oh boy, it's a strange picture. Let's look at, uh, let's see if I can try that again. I don't want that, I want this picture. There we go. Okay, let's, let's see if I can show you a picture of compression. Here's compression in action. I don't know why it's always showing such a strange look over there. Okay, here's compression. Okay, over here was, was linear. Remember this from last week. Look at here's peak clipping. No mercy. In this case, the MPO was set at 120. Over here, you've got a compression happening. So look what's happening here. It's the same graph. I, notice I, I've kept the gain at 60, just for the heck of it, just so that things are consistent. So you can see linear gain happening here, 45 degree angle, input increases of 20, output increases of 20. 20 to 20, input output ratio. Remember the first number is the increases to input, second number is the increases to output, the corresponding right. output increase. 20 over 20 is one, one over one. But now, look what happens past 60. Here's your knee point. And look at this hard peak clipping. No mercy. Not nada. More than 120 can come out of this hearing aid at all. Whereas here, in compression land, using compression, look at this. As my input increased from 60 to 80, yes, I set my MPO to be a 120-ish, 120, 120. But look at here. As my input went up from 60 to 80, my output went from 120 to maybe 125, maybe. So I'll follow my cursor to the left. I went to here. So it's kind of like, yeah, maybe about, maybe it went up just a few dB. Let's say it went up by 4 dB. Let's call this right here. Let's call this 124. Let's say as my input increased from 60 to 80, my output only went up by 4 dB. Well, 20 to 4. Input increases of 20 resulted in a 4 dB output increase. 20 to 4, if you do your math, is 5 to 1. It's a 5 to 1 compression ratio. So yes, your output did increase, but it didn't increase by as much. And again, it's like the rapids in the river. It slowed down. It didn't completely dam up the river, but the, it's limiting the MPO by sort of putting on the brakes, not slamming. No, you're still down. setting that MPO at a certain level, but it's still allowing above that to come yeah. through so that you're not getting that kickback, that correct. slapping yeah. noise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's correct. Good way of understanding. Okay. It yeah. just turns it down for the... Okay, That's right. It. Yep. I got it. It, it just you. slows things down. So let's look at our good old PowerPoint here. And, uh, okay, and I will get out of this particular... Boy, this thing is being stubborn today, I'll tell you. I was just thinking, you know, just because a tree falls in the woods doesn't mean that it didn't make a sound. So I'm thinking if even if you set your... The, the NPO at a certain level, it's, you know, if, like if you're standing in front of the train, it's still going to be that much louder. I just, I couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. is, is there ever a stopping point with compression? Well, yes, in, the, in, in practical life, I mean, you really, I mean, you could be standing in front of the train with the hearing aids on like that, but the hear, maybe the train noise itself is going to be getting into your ear around the hearing aid. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of life factors. I just think of it okay. simply like basically your idea is to limit the maximum power output so as to not cause more okay. hearing loss. And there's two ways of doing that. Right. The old way was peak clipping. The new way is compression, essentially. Okay. Now, you can have all kinds of different compression ratios. Look at this here. This is an example. I'll make this here large. Take a peek at this one here. What can happen to good people with different compression ratios? Okay. Whoa. Bad zooks. What a strange. My computer is just really acting up here. I've got to just, I want that picture. I'm trying to find that picture. Okay. Where are we here? No, not there. There. This is the one. Okay. Once again, there. So look at linear gain, black on the left. And I'm giving you just, again, a fictitious example of a fictitious hearing aid just pulled out of my head. And I'm always using 60 as the gain. So look at, look at what it says in terms of numbers. This is just, this is what's coming off of the input output function. 
Input of zero, output of 60, my gain is 60. Input of 10, output of 70, my gain is 60. Input of 20, output of 80, gain is 60. So you've got linear one-to-one -one amplification happening here. And what is your, how much linear gain are you getting? 60 in this particular case. And then let's say they set the knee point at 60. That's why I put my asterisk here. So now no more than 120 is going to come out of that hearing aid. Okay, 70 in, output's held at 120. My gain must be only 50. Input of 80, output's held at 120. My gain is only 40, I guess. That's peak clipping. All right, now let's look at output limiting compression. This is the first type of compression invented. And in this case, the compression ratio is 10 to 1. And this might help answer your question, Tina. We'll talk about this. Watch. I kept my knee point the same. Okay? Input of 0, output of 60, gain is 60. Input of 10, output 70, gain is 60. Everything, God's in his heaven, all's well with the world. In fact, these red numbers here are identical to these black numbers here. Nothing's changed. So the hearing aid is providing linear gain below its knee point. Yep, but now above its knee point, it's using compression. Now watch this. 60 in, 120 out, my gain is 60. 70 in, output is now 121. My gain is 51. So I'm, as my input increased from 60 to 70, as my input increased by 10, my output increased by 1. That's a 10 to 1 compression ratio. 80 coming in, my output increased only by another one. You got a big rapids happening here in this uh, current, okay? So my gain has slowed down. 90 in, uh, my input went up by another 10. My output only gave another 1 dB. Just barely, it's just grudging. So the line that would be seen here in this case, if I was to show what the input-output function looked like here, my gosh, if I pulled up this particular graph and made it the one of concern, this line here would be really flat. It would be like, the red line would be like, eh. So if my input increased by 20 in this case, my output of, would have only increased by 2. 10 to 1. 20 over 2, 10 over 1. So this red line would be even flat. So it's almost exactly like this one. It's just a little bit of give, okay? That's called your compression ratio. What's your, in, what's your ratio? Is it one to one? Oh, that's linear gain. That's the blue line. If it, is it 10 to one? Is it five to one? Is it six to one? What, what is your compression ratio? So to summarize the Knee point is the when of compression. When did compression begin? And the ratio is the how much compression did you give? And hearing aid compression is adjustable. On all digital hearing aids, the knee point is adjustable and the ratio is adjustable. It depends on what you want. And I'll tell you something to make our lives simpler the software automatically does this for you. You're not sitting there calculating this crap. This is not what we do when we fit hearing aids, okay? I'm just teaching you what's happening underneath because you're a clinician and you need to know what's going on, okay? You need to know the language of hearing aids. But no, fear not. You're not sitting there working with input-output ratios and calculating. When you input the audiogram on NOAA and you've chosen your manufacturer, Oticon for example, and you've picked a hearing aid product from Oticon, you are going to fit that the software is going to automatically set the compression. You have to tell what the what the MPO you want is, you know, stuff like that. But basically the software will do it for you. And your job then afterwards is to say, oh, so the software said I'd be getting this and this frequency response. Hmm, let me do real ear and prove it. That's the job of a clinician.
Okay, the software predicts, it sets the hearing aid according to the audiogram of your client and all the compression and the linear gain is all inputted for you. You don't, you don't have to choose that. It's done for you. And then the hearing aid, the software says, oh, this is the frequency response you're going to get. Okay, well then do real ear. Find out, did you get that frequency response? That's why it's called real ear. It's in the so client. So would, would that be the determination of when you, uh, like let's say Starkey has their own you know, thing of compression for their hearing aids. How, how do I know when to choose theirs or when to choose DSL? Oh, or now or no, that's or, good. I'm glad you're asking these questions. People choose the fitting method as a matter of his or her philosophy. This truly is. Are you Baptist or are you Methodist? Are you Presbyterian or Catholic? No, really, I'm serious. It's, it's your faith. Your fitting methods are your. That's your belief as to how you think works best with the client. Some people like DSL. DSL came from a child's fitting method. It was meant for fitting babies, okay? And the idea behind DSL was to make sure that child learned language. And for that child to learn language, he or she's got to hear everything. You've got to hear every sound from A to Z. So, okay, they, had, they were known to be quite a powerful fitting method. They tended to overfit adults. NAL from Australia came along, okay? DSLs from Canada, pinko country to the north of you. And NALs from Australia, a pinko country to the south of you. <laughs> and NAL was kinder. It said, yeah, mighty. You don't need to provide that kind of amount again. That's a wee bit much for the child, you know. So we think we come from a different corner over here, you know, and they just have a different philosophy. <laughs> so they fit less. Okay. And then a few years ago, NAL and DSL met in a back alley and had a fist fight. And NAL won. And DSL backed off. And DSL-5, version 5, is a lot less than DSL version 4. So in 2007 or something like that, DSL-4 was killed. The guy who invented it, Seawald, Richard Seawald, a professor, he gave me a picture of DSL-4, like a pillow guy with blood on, it, on its head, saying he had killed DSL-4. And he came out with DSL-5, which is very similar to NAL and L2. Very similar. In fact, a man on a flying horse would be hard-pressed to notice the difference. I think DSL-5 gives a little bit more gain in the lows and highs Whereas NAL tends to give a little bit more gain than DSL-5 in the, five in the mids. NAL tends to like the mids. Tends to. DSL so the, tends the to like the, the brand ends. Specific, how do we know what the brand specific is? Oh, that's if, that's if you're on the software and then the brand specific, you can choose that. You can choose NAL, you can choose DSL, you can choose right. brand specific. They call it the proprietary software. I'll get, let you in on a little secret. Don't use it. Okay. I'll tell you why. Manufacturers' proprietary fitting methods tend to cut off the highs too much. They tend to make the hearing aid too weak. It's not very – our job is to be a physiotherapist of the cochlea. Our job is to kind of – stretch things. The, guy, the person's not used to hearing. So at first, yep, I underfit. When the person's first wearing hearing aids, I tend to fit. I tend to use now. Not always, but I tend to. They're close. It doesn't hardly matter. But I use now with, a, with minus five. You know, I kind of back off a little bit. I kind of, and then after a few weeks, I'll have the guy come in and I'll crack, I'll, I'll make the hearing aid approach target a little bit closer. So that by the time a month or two has passed, now I'm okay. making the hearing aid fit target. Okay? But generally, the targets okay. of, of proprietary fitting methods, they tend to be suspect. I don't like them. There's a lot of good articles. And if you Google up 
So Google up this article and check this one out because it's very good. It's, if you Google up the article, it's called, it's by an author named Sanders, as S-A-N-D-E-R-S, Sanders. And the next author is Studi, S-T-O-O-D-Y. And another author is Mueller, M-U-E-L-L-E-R, Gus Mueller, who wrote a, a textbook that one of you, that you guys are using. Anyway, Google up those three authors. Just put Sanders, Studi, Mueller, and I'll bet you dollars to donuts up will pop up an article written in 2015 about now versus proprietary fitting methods and okay. how they compare among the five different manufacturers. They chose five hearing aid companies. Very good article to read, and it's very, yeah. it's very damning on proprietary fitting methods. It really, oh, it's not a friend of proprietary fitting methods. So most audiologists really don't like it either. It's a, it's a, they tend to underfit, but we're good here. This is good. Let's uh, share screen here and I will get out of this. I'll try to anyway. Good grief. There we go. And let's look at our good old Microsoft Word. Where are we here? Okay, da 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 da. da. We can scroll down. Don't worry about this page here or the top here, symmetric versus asymmetric. Nobody cares, okay? Nobody cares. Important, however, is linear hearing aids. When a hearing aid is providing linear gain, that's when it is providing the cleanest, crisp sound. Think of the old 7-Up commercial. Clean, no caffeine, man. Okay, <laughs> linear gain is great. When there's nothing else distorting it, it's fantastic. And that, by the way, have you ever heard of Sam's Club? You ever heard of yes. HLT, Hearing Lab Technology? They sell a hearing aid that uses something called ADRO. And ADRO means Adaptive Dynamic Range Optimization. Don't worry about memorizing it. But those hearing are linear and they don't use compression. You know what they do? They provide either less linear gain or more linear gain, but they don't use compression to limit the MPO. It's a weird technology and only Sam's Club sells it. Okay, well we're winding down toward the end of today. This is all good. Now we can look at review. Let's look at this in blue or whatever. Compression hearing aids were often called automatic gain control. In English, that just meant they provide a different gain for different inputs. It's because the, the line had a little bit of a give, okay? It wasn't flat like peak clipping. It didn't use peak clipping. It had a little bit of give. As my input increased by 10, my output might have increased by two. Or as my input increased by 10, my output might have only increased by one, whatever. Hearing aids often provide nonlinear amplification, read compression. Linear gain for soft sounds, and then look at this, a little bit of compression for medium sounds like speech, and then a lot more compression for loud inputs. This is today, we're talking about today now. So we provide linear gain for soft inputs, and then a little bit of compression for average inputs like speech, and then if someone starts yelling, a lot of compression, or as Tina mentioned, the loud train going by. The hearing aid will automatically go into a lot more compression. Input-output function with a two-to-one ratio, very small. Let's see if I can show you an example of that in your PowerPoint. Let's see if I've got that here. Not sure. Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe rain, maybe snow. No, nope, don't have it. Anyway, don't worry about that. Let's just read it. And we'll talk about that next week for sure. If you had a two to one ratio. Oh, I can, yeah, let's look at, I can, I know which picture to show you. Here we go. I know exactly which one to show you. Let's go back up to this weird exam, this particular picture here. Look at the blue. The blue is very popular today. It's called wide dynamic range compression. Its focus isn't on limiting the ceiling. You know why? Because the hearing aid is weak. 
This is the hearing aid for Mrs. McGillicuddy, who has mild to moderate hearing loss. Typical. Maybe her hearing is like 15 at 250 hertz, going down to 30 at 1,000 hertz, going down to about 50 at 4 and 8,000 hertz. Just a gentle, sloping sensory neural loss. Well, you know what? For her, our focus isn't even going to be on limiting the MPO. Our focus is going to be on lifting the floor. Not limiting the ceiling, lifting the floor. Because we're trying to imitate outer hair cells here. Because she's got outer hair cell damage. Mild sensory hearing loss. So what's going to be the degree of her hearing loss? Mild to moderate. Because what do the outer hair cells do? Help the inner hair cells pick up sounds below 50 dB. Slain and pimple. So watch this. Look what the hearing aid's doing here. Input of zero, output of only 40. My gain is 40. It's a weaker hearing aid. It's weaker. Input of 10, output of 50. My gain is still 40. Input of 20, output of 60. My gain is still 40. It's linear gain, but less linear gain. Input of 40, output of 80. My gain is still 40. God's in his heaven. All's well with the world. Now we've hit the knee point. Look at the asterisk. Input of 50, now my output is only 85. My input went up by 10, my output went up by 5. 10 over 5 is equal to 2 over 1. Here's my compression ratio here, 2 to 1. My input increases from 60 to, or 50 to 60, my output one increased by another 5. So as my inputs increase by 10, my outputs are correspondingly increasing only by five. Now that's a very weak compression ratio, very weak. In other words, if I was to show you what the line might look like on our previous picture here, okay, and pull this guy up. Come on, Ted, I know you can do it. Here, the red line would be like this. Whoops, yeah, let's, let me show you, I'll just let me show if I see if I can, uh, Take that particular picture, and I'm actually going to draw it just to bug you. Okay, I'm going to hit copy, and I'm going to hit paste. No, oh, I want to just paste. No, I don't want that. Paste. Paste option. Here you go. There. So I'm going to put this guy here. I'm going to, let's see if I can lift it a bit. I'm going to lift this one here. Whoops. Getting a bit tough here. Oh, come on. Why can't I do this? Okay, here. And a lift. No, it's not letting me. No, it's not letting me. For some reason, I don't know why. Sorry about that. What I wanted to do is to show you. You're getting strange screw-ups happening in the, in, in the gold mine here. Don't worry about that. Your line would go more like this. Follow my cursor. Instead of being 45 degree angle, my line would kind of angle up at less of an angle. So as my input increased by 20, my output would increase by 10. Okay, so this line wouldn't be flat. Oh, let's see if I could show you here. This line here, okay, whoops. This line here would not be quite as flat here. It would go kind of like on an angle like this. So as my input increased by 20, my output incre would increase by 10. So I'd still have compression, but it would be weaker. So if we go back to our notes now and take a peek, see here at the notes, and you will conclude here. Definition of input output function with a two to one ratio, gain function no longer 45, but function is still a straight line, but a 10 dB increase results in a five dB output increase. This is very, very popular and common today. There are two families of, right here. One's called output limiting compression, and that's, a high compression ratio, wide dynamic range compression, a low compression ratio. And those are used for two different camps of sensory neural loss. Mild to moderate sensory loss, 
They're actually the hardest to please because they can hear without their hearing aids. The easiest people we've said last week or the week before are people who, who have a big hearing loss. They've got not only outer hair cell damage, they've got inner hair cell damage. Now their hearing loss is severe. Now their hearing loss is like 80. Guess what kind of compression they use? Output limiting. You know why? Because the hearing aids are powerful, strong like bull, and they're going to be putting out so much output that they have to be very concerned not to cause more hearing loss. So they provide a lot of gain, but suddenly when the compression decides to kick in the brakes, it slams on the brakes. It's like the kid in his dad's car speeding down the road and suddenly seeing the stop sign up ahead and slamming on the brakes. Okay, it waits for a long time to go into compression, but once it goes into compression, it really goes into compression. That's output limiting compression. High knee point, high compression ratio. Wide dynamic range compression for mild to moderate sensory loss. Here you're not so worried about limiting the MPO. The hearing aids are weaker. They're not going to be providing as much gain anyway. Here, your focus is on raising the floor. You want to imitate the outer hair cells because that's what she's got damaged. So the car analogy is like this. Mrs. McGillicuddy in the car ahead of you is going toward the stop sign. And way before the stop sign, she gently applies the brakes, pissing off everyone behind her. That's WDRC. Low knee point, low ratio. The knee point might be set at 40 or 50. The hearing aid's almost always in compression. It's only giving linear gain for really soft sounds. But as soon as the sound becomes like average speech, the hearing aid's already putting a little bit of compression, albeit a weak degree of compression. So with WDRC, the compression is really meant to address the floor. It's a weak degree of compression. Maximum gain is only given for very soft sounds, and maximum gain is the linear gain. And then there's a weak degree of compression provided for middle, for medium, and for loud inputs. And what degree is that? About a two to one ratio. Weak compression. For Sam, who's got an 80 dB flat loss, and he's had that loss ever since he was a kid. He had measles or something, whatever. He's got a severe hearing loss. Output limiting compression. Your hearing aid will be stronger, and then you're going to set the compression to be more powerful. The hearing aid won't go into compression until it needs to, but when it goes into compression, it will really go into compression. Okay? That's essentially the families of compression that are used today. So really, when we'll look at more of this as we go on, but check out for yourself, here's these examples here. You know, compression hearing aid with 50 decibels of gain. Knee point is at 50. Compression ratio is 2 to 1. Input of 50, output of 100. Okay, because your knee point is at 50 and your gain is, 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 is fit, your, your input, your gain is 50. Knee point's at 50, compression ratio 2 to 1. An input, input of 50 will therefore be an output of 100 because you're right at the knee point but not beyond it. But an input of 60 is going to be an output of 105. You went up by 10, your output only went up by 5. Another example, a hearing aid compression knee with, with 50 dB of gain, knee point at 50 dB SPL again, ratio, here I says ration, yeah, nice Ted. Anyway, ratio 10 to 1. Input of 50 is going to be an output of 100, just like it was in the previous one. But now when I go up by 10, my output only increased by 1. That's an input, that's a compression ratio of 10 to 1. And then your general camps of compression, we will be addressing in the weeks to come. We will cross this way again for sure, absolutely, no kidding. What we're going to do next week is Unit 2. And we will do practice reading input output functions it's just simple practice you might want to pull those uh that load that powerpoint and the notes off of canvas and take a look at that for yourselves be sure to have that printed up 
for next week's Zoom session. But no worries, any confusion we've got, it'll get ironed out as the weeks go by. But we've done, a, I think, a good job today of summarizing basically the language of compression and the basically the two camps. Knee point being the when, ratio being the how much. All right, cool. So the, the quiz that's up now that's due like this weekend, is that only on this first unit? Yes. Okay, so we can go ahead and it take it. It should that. be anyway. I'll, I'll check that to be sure. In fact, okay. why don't I just, I'll t let me take a peek see right now. I'll just take a look. I'm going to go and go into my, into what I've got on OTC and make but sure. I show, I show it's due the 10th, which is this weekend. Yeah, the 10th. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let's make sure. Because I always like to wait till after the last Zoom session before I do yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes Lynn and I get 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 uh, get our our wires crossed here. So I'm going to just pull it up and see what that quiz looks like. OTC and 240, and here's your finals. Well, I can't tell you what that is. Let's pull up this. Do I have your quizzes here? Practice? No, that's your that's just your notes. Let's look at your quizzes. Ah, midterm quiz. Let's see what the let what the quiz is here. <laughs> see what that guy even looks like. Oh yeah, here you go. So I would, you know what? I would wait until after your. I'm gonna I'm gonna send everybody a, a, a remind about that. I think you should wait until we've t done done next week. I say that because like stuff like this. You know, we didn't really, you know, I think what we want to do, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's wait for the, for, for, at, for the, like the day after next week. And I'll, I'll email Lynn Royer the same. I'll, I'll tell her that. Okay. Okay. Glad you asked that. Okay. So wait till after next week's Zoom. Yep. yep correct. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds like a great, I think that's, that's a good idea. Mind you, I mean, when you look at stuff like this, you could answer this. I mean, we've done that stuff. This right. is all stuff we've done today. Okay, uh -huh. but I'm gonna just I, I'm gonna just say let's hold off until at uh, till two till Tuesday next week. Okay. Okay. Thanks for reminding me. I will send out a remind. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll stop share screen here and uh, bid you all adieu. Live long and prosper, and we'll see you when we look at you. All it right. Wednesday. All right. Okay. I bye will bye. stop recording.